Um, so I think I'll give you uh, in the 25 minutes I have. Uh -huh.
to give you the best access to your metal. Uh, so that we can basically run the world on Java. You know, we uh, I, I would guess that we run a fair fraction of the world now on Java. Let's uh, let's keep keep going and, and double down. <coughs> Now, in order to make this work, uh, the VM in particular has a whole ton of technical initiatives that are working. Um, this, is, this slide just gives you a, a, a snapshot of it. I'm not going to explain it. I'm going to move on and, and tell you in detail. You, I trust you will be able to see the slides uh, after the fact. Yes. Um, that, I'm, dip, I'm relying on that. I want to give six uh, lightning talks in the very short time I have remaining um, about the um, uh, some trends that I think are interesting and relatively new in some ways. Um, Java on Java, as exemplified in Project Metropolis, which you've already heard of. Uh, classier primitives, I'll explain that in a second, but that's value types. And uh, uh, richer language support, that's some really interesting little books that we're doing in collaboratively. We, when I say we, I mean we VM nerds. Um, in collaboration with the language nerds, the Brian Getzes. Um, we, we, want, we, we have fruitful conversations with them uh, with, between Project Amber and Valhalla. And then, of course, the hardware access in Panama that, that Mark alluded to is another interesting trend to watch. Um, uh, concurrency getting uh, more frequently and uh, granular, uh, better control of race conditions. That's uh, trend number five. I think we're going to get better over time. And also, uh, let's, let's uh, scale up. To, uh, to bigger workloads, and um, there's some really exciting stuff happening in, uh, in recent months and the coming months with, uh, with some uh, scaling stuff. And all of this, I, I uh, emphasize, we want it to happen in the sunshine, in the open with the community. This is something that we want to do uh, collaboratively and quickly in the open source setting. So, trend number one, um, Java hosts more of itself. Um, as Mark pointed out, the Growl JIT as an experimental uh, feature is coming to a release near you. Uh, this is just the beginning of a series of experiments where we think we will eventually be able to um, tear ourselves away from that C++ code we love so much and code more in Java. Um, so starting with Growl Code Generator, which uh, is an amazing piece of, of technology, it has actually a quite long lineage. Um, it's been, much of it has been fostered by either some of it in Sun Labs and some of it, much of it at uh, Johannes Kepler University in, uh, in Austria. Deep, deep research. The scales here are really quite impressive. Um, we're looking at 10, uh, 10 years, 10-ish 10, 10 years of, of, uh, of, of calendar, and just over that period of time, probably hundreds of staff years of engineers working away, um, many of which are grad students now, uh, you know, now, now contributing as, as professors or researchers. It's, it's, uh, it's, been, a, it's been an amazing run, and uh, now we, uh, we've used uh, Grawl as, a, as an engine for AOT. That was our first piece of Grawl in Anger in OpenJDK for, for, for the JDK itself. And then also it's a candidate for Project Metropolis for replacing the CPJIT as, as, um, uh, as Mark mentioned. So those of you who have experimented with this uh, and worked on it and, and in hope tried out Grawl as a, uh, as a, as a JIT for the future, like Chris, yeah, uh, there's more to come. Join us. Um, Grawl is also good with interpreters and scripting languages, but uh, you'll have to look elsewhere for information about trouble. So Project Metropolis is the experimental clone of JDK 11, it's really .jdk, whatever, whatever the current JDK is, where we can try to make Java implement itself. We bootstrap Java on Java, and we, we, we nudge out the C++ code and the assembly code that we've been depending on and replace it by, uh, by up-level Java code. <laughs> Um, this requires a certain kind of system Java, which can ably replace C++. Um, we are experimenting with an engine called SDM, Substrate DM, that will uh, give us the ability to um, shrink down uh, closed Java subsystems uh, into code that is similar to what C++ compiler would produce. And so that will lead us into the, uh, the world of being able to take discrete modules from Hotspot uh, like the, uh, maybe even the verifier and translate them into system Java and replace the C++ code. 
The, uh, the big one, of course, is replacing C2. But C2 is just the, the most optimized input generator. We also want to be able to replace C1 and the interpreter and various stubs so that we can have a system that is running on one code generator. And of course, last month we discovered um, what happens if you have too many code generators and then you get a hardware bug that requires them all to be upgraded in parallel, which would be nice if we depended on just one code generator. And that's, that's, that's the vision for, uh, for, for the Java ecosystem, is to, have a, uh, is to own our own code generation rather than uh, get it from our excellent colleagues at uh, LLVM. So, tomorrow's reference implementation, more Java, Java on Java. And here's a roadmap, I won't go into details, but uh, we, can think, we think we can make this work, and we're getting step, step by step closer. Next, lightning talk, how do primitives get classier? Uh, primitives, of course, they're very goat, but maybe we can add some class to them. Um, the big idea is value types, of course. Uh, what is a value type? Well, it's a thing which is like an object, but it's also like an int. Um, there, it has the good features of both and mixes them together in a new way that you can't just get with today's object with today's hints. So we want to heal the rift between those primitives. We've always felt like a sort of a necessary but bolted on part of Java. So we make them all like more like uh, more like classes. So the trick here is to distinguish a new type of class called a value class, which is distinct from an object class. And the value class defines things like ints, which have interesting properties I'll tell you very quickly now. The basic slogan is that it codes like a class, but it works like an int. In other words, there is a value class with methods and fields and all this stuff. But in the end, it sort of packages up and scrunches up into this unit of stuff which behaves like an int. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute how that's going to behave like an object. This uh, project also requires something really, I mean, that's hard. What's even harder is doing uh, parametric polymorphism, full polymorphism, uh, generics over not only objects but also values, including primitives. So list of int, yes, that's coming. That's uh, and list of complex, where complex is a user defined type. Good stuff. Uh, this will require. Oh my gosh, this is the this is the biggest uh, change we've ever made in the byte codes, and uh, I hope the last the last big change we ever made. Um, we say that. Um, in any case, it will require huge changes to tools and VMs, and the VMs, um, VMs ready for this. The effect on our source code is that um, it's probably going to have a similar effect that generics had on our source code, that Lambda's had on our source code. In other words, we will have to learn some new things. Here's how I code with value types. Um, but the benefits will, I think, be comparable. Basically, um, classes are really great for, for encapsulation, and the system that Java has of interfaces is a really good way to talk about classes without knowing much about their implementations. And we believe we can spread that uniformly to value types as well. And, and once we grandfather in on these primitives as value types, then we will have um, we will have unity, and we can all see to play out. So, but if we if we bring the two sides together, then they both get stronger. Primitives then from this point of view are really just a restricted kind of a class. I hope someday we will actually write some classes for int, flow, boolean, etc. that will show you what their intrinsic uh, state and methods are. And those will just be value classes. And yeah, they'll have a special uh, special pleading in the VM, but that won't be what you care about. It's just, op it's just optimization. Um, here's a bit of theory about uh, which I'll uh, give you just a taste. Here's what's different about value types from, from object types, uh, value classes from object classes. The JVM is encouraged and enabled to flatten value types. In other words, if I have a uh, containing type, a containing type that has a field of complex, maybe it's even complex float, right? And then um, that complex float that components that will be inlined into the containing object. That's called flattening. And arrays of them will be flattened in a similar way. And um, the, G the VM isn't required to do this, but it's allowed to and encouraged to. And that's the, uh, that's, uh, that allows us to get that cache-friendly data structure that we're after. In order to do that, they must be non-nullable. Null doesn't fit with int. You need, you need 33 bits if you're going to have int or null as a type, right? So 32 bits, that's a non-nullable int. Same way for, same for value types. It also has to be identity-free. You can't say which 42. I want to lock this 42. That's not going to be allowed. And so again, they're identity uh, free. So the whole the VM has to. If the VM does have like little pointers to things holding value payloads, those have to be completely isolated and made invisible to the user. Interesting challenge. So they're flattened. 
they, uh, they, they can be buffered. You can refer to them internally in the VM by pointers, but, they, um, but the pointers are never significant to the user. And therefore, you can rebuffer them. You can take the same value and you can buffer it in two different places if that's convenient. Or if you see the same value in two different places, you can maybe on a GC pass deduplicate them. All those things are allowed once identity is removed. Interfaces apply equally to value classes and object classes, which means that interface, interface code can work equally well on values and objects. And uh, object itself is an honorary interface. And that's, uh, that's just a piece of, of force fit that we have to do in order to uh, make object be a value, uh, a potential value. Basically, object is sort of like comparable or runnable. It's, uh, it's, it's an abstract thing. And that gives us the ability to work immediately with value types in today's um, erased generics. Although we want to do more, we want to do parametric polymorphism. We want to make generalizations that, that work across all values, but at the same time, they, they allow you to com compile specialized code that is optimized for the very particular uh, very particulars of a, of a particular value type parameter. So if I say list of complex flows, I want the, um, the, the, the le internal layout of that list not to box each individual complex or each individual float. I want it to have uh, some sort of flat array with uh, real float, imaginary float, real float, imaginary float, all laid out in, in, in a small set of cache lines. And uh, there's, uh, that's just the starting point. There's a lot more to say about it. But we, what we need is something like C++ templates, but more dynamic. Um, and in order to, uh, this, this mechanism will give us a lot of interesting, um, interesting plays once we once we get it online. Okay, um, one way to think about this is remember that when you're coding generics, your generic types T are in some sense universal, and the T is not the same thing as an object type or an interface type. It's a it's a type parameter type, and there are tricks you can do with the T that you can't do with a plain old interface. Same will be true for these new enhanced uh, generics. This is hard. I won't tell you why, um, but that's the slide, OK? That's what we get. Um, but the effect of having full parametric polymorphism is you can write generic algorithms over all of your types, not just the object types, all the values, primitive, and, and, and reference types. And so you can have, have you noticed those places like in Java util arrays where there's seven or eight different kinds of methods for each different primitive type? And it's, it, the overloading makes uh, hi hides the shame of it. But uh, if you look at the source code, you see that it's bad. Um, so you know, we're going to fix that, right? We're going to be able to parameterize over all those types and have a, ge a true generic sort, sort algorithm, for example. I think that will lead us to, to better kinds of generics, better kinds of algorithms on arrays. Um, one thing important to note is that we do not intend to expand these things statically. We intend to expand them dynamically and, in a sense, only when needed. Although AOT engines will be able to pre-provision uh, 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 templated species if necessary. So um, I'm going to just skip that last one. Okay, what are species? I mentioned species. Well, a species is the combination of a template which has formal parameter holes in it with fillings for those holes causing a particular template to be expanded into the species. So that's, uh, that's the basic idea. The VM has to be deep in the game on this, so it requires deep cuts in the VM. Uh, the hardest problem is to arrange things so that you don't have to uh, make a million copies for every different species of the code. You want shared code if possible, but when it gets hot, you want to specialize it just like the JIT does today. Uh, interesting thing number three uh, in my last six minutes. Um, so Amber is, as I said, a sort of a handshake between the language designers and the VM. Um, there's a number of little toolkitty things that are really cool. One of them, uh, which is coming in, uh, which is uh, sailing towards uh, 11, is the uh, constant dynamic. Um, that's, a, that's a part of a trend that I call bootstrap methods everywhere. Bootstrap methods turn out to be a good trick, so we're going to just use them like crazy. We have a bootstrap method at call site, that's easy. A bootstrap method in constant pool, that's handy. A bootstrap method in a, uh, in a method definition, that's, uh, that doesn't have a cute name, maybe Mindy, but it, what it really is is a method recipe that expands on use and produces the body of the method. Can you imagine writing your two string or your serialization um, boilerplate that way? And then you don't have to load it, you just expand it when you use it. 
So uh, other pieces are uh, nest mates and seedling. You, you can sort of watch the, um, the Valhalla lists to see the, the smaller features that we're doing for, for uh, support of, of, uh, lang of new language stuff. So what this leads us to is a, play, uh, a situation where when the language designers tell the VM designers what they, what they need, the VM designers can give them the right generic mechanisms and hooks uh, for, for new kinds of translation strategies, then the language designers can do really wild new features, but without uh, increasing this, the bytecode size of their, of their classes. You might have noticed if you're, uh, if you're a fan of Scala, that one of the downsides of Scala is that it can't use weirdo VM features under the covers. It has to use standard bytecodes. And as a result, one line of Scala can turn into 20 different class files in your jar, each one of them of a significant size because of all the little adaptive classes that are needed. Um, we think with the bootstrap method uh, uh, trick, we can avoid doing that and make it much more dynamic. Uh, Panama has already been discussed, and there's some interesting information here on in the slide deck for you, so I'll let you look at that. But the basic idea is uh, better JNI. Um, we want uh, to not work with uh, foreign calls in a heavyweight way. We want foreign code to be brought in as basic blocks in, right in there with the Java code. Um, so, that, uh, so basically, you get um, inline calls to printf and whatever other uh, Unix primitives you want to call. The way the, the idea behind making making this work is the binder pattern, which knows how to wire up uh, foreign calls to the whatever the low-level facilities are in the JVM. And you, again, you don't have to pre-compile all of the little uh, stubs and things. You just let the binder create them before you go and fly. But in, in essence, it'll give you more direct access to your, uh, to your code and data at the, at the C programming level and even at the assembly level. Speaking of the assembly level, uh, Intel has uh, worked with us to produce a really wonderful um, proof of concept called the Vector API, where basically you write a Java loop with Java objects, a Java interfaces, Java generics, and it compiles right down into AVX code that you could have written in the assembly by yourself. And you would have been proud to write it as an assembly programmer, but it comes from Java, which is great. And we think we can expand that, that story to uh, platforms beyond Intel, including GPUs. So uh, there's some references for Panama. Loom, awesome. Fibers, we need more fiber in our diet. We uh, need fewer um, uh, dinosaurs to strain over. We want to um, break up the, um, the, uh, the live parts of our computation into small independent bits that are mounted on a dinosaur thread that gallop along for a millisecond. And then they dismount, and then millions of other fibers are also mounting on the same dinosaur thread uh, over time. So the, the ultimate goal is to have millions of little concurrent units and just one, um, just, just a small number of, of, of server threads. Again, this requires tricky cuts in the JVM interpreter because we need to be able to quickly mount and dismount fiber computations um, on, on threads. It's like a, a, it's like a user level scheduler for, for very tiny threadlets. Um, I already explained this. So I'm going to go on, and uh, Ron Kressler has, uh, work, is working on this um, since last year, and he was extending his work on Quasar, which was a user mode above the level of the VM. Now he's naturalizing the idea of these, these interruptible um, continuations on the, on, inside the Java VM itself. It uses a low-level concept called continuations, on which you build a high-level concept called fibers, but you could also build generators and other concepts in the future. Finally, uh, our scale will get scalier, and uh, my time is almost out. But it's easy. This is an easy point to make. Um, so we have new pointer-based read and read barriers in Project Shenandoah. Really cool. This is really low latency uh, heaps, giant heaps at low latencies. And guess what? Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, here we are. Another project that somehow uncloaked itself, um, and it uses a different kind of a read barrier. So now we have the, uh, the fight of the read barriers. Do we use Brooks pointers or do we use bit based branches? Oh no, um, how are we going to decide this? There's too many new technologies floating around, but you know, we can handle this. We're a community. We have some short term tasks to work with this besides the individual project work. We want to make sure that we refactor everything that's common to the two projects into one source space and upstream that stuff um, so that when you eventually do dock these two different algorithms in, um, it's not a huge amount of work to. To, uh, to have one or the other, and maybe even both live in the same uh, in the same system. This enables not only coexistence but also stealing up good ideas from each other, which is a great thing in the community. 
long-term result, like Mark said, we want to unify low latency DC technology. Um, it's a good experimental, uh, a good bench for experimenting. Hello. All right. Um, so uh, fibers also are a scaling technique, which is obvious to all of us. And another uh, technique for scaling is the um, uh, provision that you get from Max CDS and AOT, that's for container scaling. And finally, I can't talk about racing data because I'm out of time, but look at my JVM language summit talk uh, of last year. Uh, I think we are in for a new way of looking at uh, managing races in the Java memory model. So, lots of crazy stuff. <laughs> can't look at that, but let's go there as a community. <laughs>